Thank you so much for being on this incredible rise journey with me. Filming the first series has been such a labor of love. We've met so many incredible people with amazing stories to tell. There were so many incredible bits that we've decided to pull together two highlight reels to showcase some of the most special moments. I hope that you love listening to them. In our first episode, we touched back at some of the amazing moments I shared with England's strongest woman, Katie Ball, inspirational and best-selling author, Donna Ashworth. But first, we're going to go back to that golden conversation I had with Lee and Simon from Boy Band Blue. It's called Rise or Rise. All rise. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we harmonized. And then when we first got together, we, it was like we wanted to be that group, but obviously we were so young. Yeah. And we, and we got signed and it went so fast. So we had to catch up. Yeah. Like it wasn't like we were. Um, I mean, talk to me about that because I mean, you were 17, weren't you, Lee? I, I mean, was you a kid. Were, I was 16. Well, he was 16. Wow, 16. Yeah. When I, got I mean, that down. is so young. We released when I was 17, but on my 17th birthday, we went to. We went out to uh, Red Cube, do you remember? Yeah, I do. I yeah. remember. Yeah. In, in Leicester Square? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Was it Leicester Square, Red Cube? Uh? Was that the place in the yeah, club in Red Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Red but Cube. I was 17. Wow. Like, so, I mean, imagine, okay, I just got out of school, really. I know, so you're, um, in, so you're in this band. Yeah. You're everywhere. You're probably... I don't being... think we were out then, were How, we? how no, old no. were you when you hit, like, the heights of Blue Success? So I was 17. Yeah. And, you was... and I was 22, yeah. I think. So, time. I mean, you were still young, though. But how, you know, how did, like, because probably from a very young age, this is what you've... I know you were into sports side, but... Yeah. Music must have been a passion, right? You've, you always wanted to do yeah, it. I sang from when I was like three years old. So yeah. I was, I was like, and I'm, so was was it always a plan? Like, I want to be famous. I want to be a big star. Or was it just about writing the no, music? No, but I just, for me, like, I I was brought up singing. Like, if you ever met my mum, she don't stop singing. She's like, she would make me mm -hmm. sing. She had a hairdressers and she'd be like, I figured out that if I sang to the clients, I'd get a pound. <laughs> So you I was did. always trying to make a pound note yeah. off it. So I thought, yeah, I might as well. Oh go my God, in. pound notes back in the day. Yeah, no, yeah. I was like, literally, I, I was always, I mean, I just love singing. I, I didn't realise I could sing until I was a bit older, really, because I used to like singing. And then I used to like see people get emotional when I used to sing. Yeah. And then I thought, oh, so I must, I must have something because you like, my friends' mums would cry or I'd make an old lady cry. I don't know if it was bad or good, but they cried. <laughs> um, and um, and I'd, I'd sing Amazing Grace and stuff like that. And I'd always see people get really, like, uh, taken, aback taken back it. when I'd sing. And I'd be like, I didn't realise I had a voice until I was about, say, 13 or yeah. something like that. Do you think that in your sort of life as, a, as performers, you've been able to be sort of authentically yourself? Or do you feel like you've always kind of had to have your guard up? No, I think we've always had that. Because, because we all know each other, we've always promised each other, listen, if any of us are getting out of hand or we feel that one's pulling away or thinks he's bigger than he is, yeah. we'll, the other three will pull you back in yeah. very quickly. Yeah. Because the only stars are in the sky. Yeah, I like that. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. we, we always stay grounded yeah. as much as possible. So I think that's also one of the reasons why after 20 years, 21 years, I think we've had one blow up. Yeah, really? One yeah. blow up of, of you. Ah, that once. That's and that was amazing. in our first, second year on our first tour. And that yeah, was but it. that was that was. And just, that was no that was one else's else. fault. That was just, what we realised is that it was people around us were whispering in our ears, yeah. winding you up. So when we did get to meet, it became something bigger. And then we looked at each other and we went, what are we, what are you we doing? We went, yeah. what are we doing here? Like, and then we realized. Because you guys are genuinely close. No, I not an act, what? is it? <laughs> but on that same <laughs> fight, it was Anthony that made me laugh because he was smashing up something. I was smashing up something. On a flight? No, in, no, in, no, a, in, in a hotel. A hotel. Oh, right, okay. But there was like pictures. We would never put so our hands on each so, other. No, so no, it, was just, it was just. I would never put just, argue, so like, smash that. No, so but, he smashed this big, massive uh, picture was on the wall. Bless the people who ever worked in this hotel. Oh, Obviously, Jesus. we paid for the damage. But he I went, paid for the he's damage. He's going, yeah, Still yeah. Me 10 and I'm grand. going, Psh, and he goes, <laughs> he goes, yeah. I'm gonna smash something Psh, like that. And then he's in the room. I'm smashing stuff outside. He's smashing stuff inside, and we're seeing who could smash the biggest thing. And then Anthony's opened up the door, and he's <laughs> gone. <laughs> <laughs> What you've gone on to do is just absolutely incredible. Because, um, you know, people have this perception that if you're like England's strongest woman, you've got to be this big, I would have think of this big butch woman. But you're like, you're slight, you're in really good shape. 
but you have unbelievable strength, right? Mm. So just talk me through, first of all, what made you decide to actually even apply for the competition? Because that's pretty heavy. Like, that's a massive challenge for you to set for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, always being a sportswoman, so from the age of four, I yeah. played hockey. hockey. Yeah, yeah, played hockey. Um, I've always had that competitive element in my life. And I think committing to a career in nursing at first meant I'm an all-in kind of girl, okay? I went into my nursing degree. Um, I studied hard. I worked part-time. I volunteered, maintained a long-term relationship, all of that business. All of me was dedicated to that. Yeah. There was no time for me to continue to play hockey at the level that I was playing at at the time. Okay, and that's, again, just something that I had to accept for now, put on the back burner. But as I sort of went on, and I was, you know, I was training in the gym, I was keeping myself fit. There was just like, again, a little bit of something missing for me. And I was thinking, you know, what is it? And I was thinking back and there's just that competitive edge just wasn't there. And I'm yeah. not an aggressively competitive person, but I like to be pushing myself. I like to know that I'm improving and I like to know that, anything that I'm doing has a purpose, really. Yeah. Moving to your sort of training for strong women, mm -hmm. um, what what kind of things did you have to do? And what would you say was one of the most mentally challenging times for you during your training? So, strong woman is... It's, it's being strong, but it's also dealing with difficult challenges and difficult objects within a competition. Yeah. Okay, so it's not just, for example, if we look at uh, common strength training exercises in the gym, a deadlift, a squat, a shoulder press with dumbbells or a barbell. When you're doing strong woman, the competitions, the fierce, the tough, you're expected to do something that you've, you've never ever done before. Right. So. You might be deadlifting a car. <laughs> you might be picking up a uh, an atlas stone, a big concrete stone that yeah. can weigh 60, 70, 90, 100, 110 kilograms. You could be pulling a truck, pushing a truck. Um, you could be picking up a monster dumbbell. I'm talking a big, massive dumbbell that weighs 30, 40 kilos. You're expected to get it from the floor over your head, okay? Wow. As well as being able to pick up a log, which is very, very long, very, very long cylindrical object. Yeah. Again, pick it up from the floor and put it over your head. Because you trained a lot of women. Mm hmm And uh, what would you say are some of the key issues that come across, in, you know, that you've kind of had to navigate through or help women navigate through? Because I'm just curious, because I think so, so, you know, many people that are sort of tuning into this podcast will be able to resonate with a lot of these. So mm -hmm. I think it'd be good to sort of talk about them and and sort of like, you know, work around them and sort of see what what you've done with your clients that somebody listening into this podcast might be able to take away and think, you know, I could do that. Yeah, I think for me, one of the biggest limiting factors for women in the weight room is self-belief, yeah. like 100%, because obviously personal training a lot of women um, work very closely with them one-to-one, -one, week in, week out in the gym, session by session. And I, I can sometimes even tell by the body language, say, the, say we're going to, into a set on squats. Um, I can see in their expression or they'll start to shake their head because for whatever reason, they just don't think that they can do it. One of the quotes that I love most that you always say is not strong for a woman, just strong. Hmm. And I love that because there's no barriers, is there? Like there's no barriers to what you're doing. Um, but I think in any aspect of our lives, you know, whether it's what you do, whether it's what I do or what anyone else does, doesn't have to be fitness related. Would you agree that your capability and what you're able to achieve fundamentally comes down to what you mentally believe you're capable of achieving and what level of, I don't know, pain or persistence you're willing and able to push through mm -hmm. in order to really reach those sort of unbelievable goals that you might secretly wish inside that you could achieve, yeah. but you don't necessarily feel you can. Yeah, I think um, I think it it becomes a habit, but but in a good way because I think it's quite unrealistic to expect that you can I don't know 
when I first started out strength training, it, for me to say, oh, um, oh, I won't be able to do this because I don't have evidence yet that I can, yet being the key word. Now, what I love about training and the weight room is every rep that you're doing or every set that you're doing is a tick in the box that you can. And that is a tick for the person that you want to be in the future, isn't it? Because Yeah, that is actually that is so powerful what you said. It's a tick in the box for the person that you know you want to be in the future. And it's your little proof and your tiny bit of evidence in that moment that actually you can. There tends to be more of a theme in your uh, poetry. You write a lot about family, about women, about love and loss, and, you know, really touching on those poignant, significant moments in our life. So what what kind of led you into to writing and poetry? Well, first of all, thank you so much. It's really kind of you. Um, I've always I've always kind of written. So I used to be a songwriter back in the day when I was young. Um, and I just, I stopped it for quite a long time. And then when I had my second child, I stopped doing something quite creative for a living and I missed it. So I just started jotting things down and I thought, you know what? It's hard being a mum running a business, doing everything on your own. I'm going to start an online magazine and see if I can bring some, you know, mums together, women together just to chat. So the page that I started on Facebook began as an online magazine called Ladies Pass It On. Um, and then I realised quite quickly that when I wrote something a little more deep, rather than sort of health and are you sleeping well? And, you know, um, when I wrote something a little deeper, it seemed to resonate. So I became yeah. more and more confident and, and it just kind of snowballed. It wasn't intentional. And then the page became solely about poetry and 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 that's how it began yeah one of my favorite scenes from the new book is never attach your self-esteem to something that moves so if you attach it to your body size or your look or your talent or a particular skill or a, something that you bring to a situation that can all change yeah and when that body size changes or you know that talent is no longer good enough or then your self-esteem is gone yeah so you need to attach your self-esteem to something solid which is the essence of who you are as a human being you know as a as a person alive on this planet who are you what makes you happy what makes you sad you deserve to have the things that make you happy and you deserve to avoid the things that really make you sad yeah. you deserve to say I don't like this yeah. but I still want to help and I still want to be here so how can I do this that doesn't take away from me but allows me still to bring it to the table and I think it's just about working on your self-esteem once that is quite solid you've got a base that you can build upon forevermore and that's definitely the first step you know we have this con um, conception that it's when we get something that we want yeah like the new car or the new house that that's when we get really happy yeah and actually what happens is we get that thing and it's the absence of wanting it actually or needing it or striving towards it anymore that actually brings that peace and that happiness but what we've yeah. been taught is um when you get the house, you'll feel better, and we do yeah. for a moment. Yeah. yeah, and then we're like, and then it, and then it ebbs off, doesn't it? And then we're like, right, well, okay, that was a, I know, well, it's still not good enough, so I need to do the, the next big thing. And for me, it's been a real learning about forget what I think I should have. What do I? What do I actually need? What do yeah. I actually? What do you need? need? What do you want? Yeah. What do you want? You don't want. We're so fixed on how people will look at us and say, "Is she living a successful life?" And how will they tell that they'll go? Is she in a relationship? Is she a mother? Does she have a nice car? Does she have her own house? Oh, she's living a successful life. She has a job and and, and it's got nothing to do with mm -hmm. any of that. But we but we judge ourselves on these goalposts, don't we? Yeah. And we put into place things that people get giant mortgages or they stay in relationships that are not serving them because that's what we're told makes a successful life you've come to earth you've been a successful human because you did this 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 and then at the end of it you go and you leave it all and you're like what well is that it yeah. and what really we should be thinking about 
leaving behind us is what people will remember. The stories that we told them, the way we made them feel, the way we empowered them to go on and find, you know, their path in life. And that's what is important. And everything else means nothing at the end of the day. Yeah. And it's nice to have a lovely house. Of course it is, especially if you feel safe there. If you can come through the door and go, and in my space, my little castle, that's a wonderful thing. If your car gets you somewhere safely and comfortably, that is a wonderful thing. Yeah. But, you know, the keeping up with the Joneses, it's never ending. And the body is the same with the body image. So once you start to look at a part of your face and change it, oh, I hated my nose for 10 years. I'm so happy. Six months later, oh, look at my teeth. Yeah. And that will never end. And then, of course, your face starts to change. You get wrinkles and you go, oh, you know, I didn't love my face before. And now it's wrinkly. You know, I hate this, it now, um, yeah. It, it's never ending. Yeah. It's misery making. It's like trying to blow away the wind. What you can do is change the way you see it, change the way you see what you have, change the way you see the way you look. And that adjustment, if you can make that adjustment where you go, oh, I'm 47 and, um, you know, this is the way I look and haven't I got a nice smile. Once you can change that in your head, there's nothing you you will never need to change anything again. Change yeah. the way you see, and everything else will change. I love that. That is that is, just and it's so hard. Beautiful. It is hard yeah. because you will be judged. But again, it goes back to the if you have your own approval, you don't need anybody else's. So it doesn't matter. 